This is Territory Tales, the stories behind the people and places that make Oregon's Mount Hood Territory so awesome. I'm your host, Jared Lyman, joined as always by Molly Johnson, who I think is probably just as excited as I am for our guest today. Absolutely. The reason is we are going to talk to probably our favorite chef of all time. You know, there, there's, wow. there's, there's many. I like food. That's why I'm rocking the dad bod over here. But Jessica Hansen, the chef and owner at the Kitchen at Middle Ground Farms. I'm just going to say I have had the pleasure of eating there so many times and taking the courses. I have never had something that I didn't like. And you throw different stuff at me than what I would normally go for. I have to say me either. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. Well, we just, the, the food, I, I'm not the only chef there. The food that comes out of our kitchen is, because we get to eat leftovers, so let me remind you, it's just delicious. <laughs> I am so happy with some of the food that comes out of there, all of the food, frankly, that comes out of the kitchen. Well, let, let's talk a little bit, you know, about the Kitchen Middle Ground Farms and how it came to be. Because I, I think, as I recall, you guys opened, what, four or five years ago it's when you really? Just five years Just now. five years, mm-hmm. yeah. Time flies. Yeah. So how did this come to be a thing? Well, it was, it was a plan, frankly. I mean, we intended to do this. And when I say this, this has evolved, meaning what we plan to do is learn to farm. We wanted to be able to source our own food. And that was really a financial decision because my husband said when we start to have kids and have a family how are we going to be able to afford your food habits because I was somebody that drove I spent my extra time driving to farms tasting different goat milk buying jersey milk different types of cow's milk for cheese making for the fun of it and um all sorts of we had CSAs from different farms we bought pork from one farm chickens from another farm and he's like how are we going to be able to afford this and I was like well by we'll, Prius. Uh, <laughs> raise it. <laughs> and I, for some reason, that seemed like a, a more financially solvent way of doing it. I'm wondering if that's the case now. But so we bought the 17 acres in Wilsonville with the intention of um, learning to raise our own food. And in doing that, we thought um, we'll learn and I'll share that journey. So we'll just, we'll put a barn on some property and we'll, I'll teach cooking classes from it. So I thought I would teach cheese making classes because that's what I was really passionate about and some preserving classes, kind of some simple canning classes. And I thought maybe, you know, four or five a month and I'd have these little children running around and it'd be <laughs> idyllic. And um, we've got a lot of that down. It's, it's still <laughs> idyllic. And I still have the children running around, but we do about six classes a week. So yeah. it's just a little bit bigger than what I had intended, but it's been really rewarding nonetheless. And those classes have a great array of things. It's not, I mean, you, you've done some cheese making stuff and, and mm-hmm. some preserves, but there's a whole wide selection of, of classes you guys offer there. Um, I, I've seen both from, you know, romantic things for the couples learning to cook or, you know, in my case, it's a solo class where I, I took for one on a trip and I just impress all my guests that with this dish, the, the uh, butternut squash lasagna I learned, still yeah. use that. That was amazing. And then the kid camps. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's literally something for any food type and any preference and any age that that's that's what we're doing yep it started out as I, as I said with the cheese making but the, I love cheese making that doesn't mean everybody else does so I love um, cheese eating we, so it's a good match right so we we just learned from knowing your market is what do people want to come and learn and what we found and how we're a little bit different than other cooking classes is that our goal really is like really great food and fun and you get to learn stuff. So some of them are so learning focused and a little bit too much ser- too serious for our population. You know, the people <laughs> around that want to come, they really want to have a really great evening and um, a really, really great way to eat dinner, frankly. And so a lot of our classes come from that and come from us as chefs. There's four of us now just exploring what we want to learn more about. And we sometimes learn through teaching. Um, we've got a fantastic two pastry chefs that um, have just skill sets in how to bake bread and Ooh. croissants and you know making layer cakes, all these things that were not part of my repertoire by any means. And so we've got to expand through the different chefs that we bring in, which has been so much fun, especially for me, just because it's, it's growing because of other chefs, not just what I know. Otherwise, I think it would be limited after five <laughs> years. I'd be like, oh, same Thai class coming up. Because there's certain, you know, you, you just... Yeah. You know, you you know a, your stuff. Yeah, you have a super diverse. I mean, I love that you had one specifically. It was like perfect timing. You had one for cast iron skillet, like how mm-hmm. they're cooking cast oh, iron. Oh, we love skillet. that. And I was just like, I just got a cast iron skillet. I want to take that class now so I can learn how to cook on it because it's a That's about all way. I use almost. You, you should keep coming. Yeah. The cast iron skillet classes are always evolving and they're super popular. People love them. Mm-hmm. But like, for instance, last night we had a private class um, for a group and they did their request was a ramen class. And it was. I love that. I don't know how to teach ramen. I don't know how to make the um, 
the noodles, the alkaline noodles. It's a different pasta making technique. Wait, wait actually making the ramen? Yes. Oh, wow. That'd and, be fascinating. Right. And so, but Andrea and Kate know how. And so I've learned through them how to do that. I took the ramen class the first time because I was like, <laughs> I actually don't know how in my chef experience don't have that in it. And so last night there was just beautiful deep broths, pickled shiitakes, these fantastically textured noodles, braised pork belly, all this stuff going into ramen. And there, I would have never been able to frankly know that without that you know, other people being interested in it. So if any of our listeners hear some sounds, that's my stomach now growling. So I'll apologize. I'll try to edit them out. (laughs) Well, they're probably too. I was just like how she describes food, the beautifully textured. I mean, how she describes food, it just makes you, yeah, all the things. I really, really, really love food. Like I get pretty (laughs) emotional about it. (laughs) So just, you think you're foodies? Like that's, that's how excited. Like I (laughs) ate a bowl of ramen. I came home last night with the kids and Kate texted me. She's like, hey, we have ramen. I, are you even home? Are you coming home? And I said, oh, I'll always have your ramen. And I made a bowl and it was the it was the leftover. So it was just piles of cilantro oh. fresh in the garden, piles of basil, thinly sliced jalapenos, like all these things. And my husband and I are just sitting there like, how are we this lucky? Like, this is so good. And he did say once before at a ramen class, he's like, this might be the best bowl of food, plate of food I've ever had out of the kitchen. I was like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> hey, wait, I didn't cook. <laughs> be, whoa, be nice. Whoa. How, how <laughs> back. What about the lamb? What about all the other things? How, how the sofa that night for him. <laughs> it was yeah, yeah a little little uncomfortable well you you mentioned the garden mm-hmm. and so that's one of the really cool things is so much of what you guys are cooking are coming from those 17 acres mm-hmm. that you have on the farm mm-hmm. it, the garden is um also our biggest challenge i'll just teach you about that so when we started the property we we grew vegetables we grew vegetables like any gardener that likes to cook yeah. um lots lots of things been in the garden i tended to all of it everything came out beautifully as the kitchen got busier that this is our biggest learning curve um we needed to pay attention to timing like when the stuff comes out of the ground we found like (laughs) year two when we were doing more classes and um it was like okay so everybody's going to eat golden beets like can't we sell (laughs) golden beets to every everybody in the class and on the flip side oh all of our arugula went to seed we better run to our table farm and get greens so timing stuff and farming for classes and a, a growing schedule has been our biggest challenge and learning through that again doing organic gardening as you grow on a bigger scale um the amount of labor that goes into like weed suppression and weed pulling it's it's been a really interesting thing so um farming if you will on a small scale when it's for yourself growing your own gardens we you know make i make cheese with the dairy milk from the gouts all that is is easy on a small scale it's not as easy to learn to farm that and so um we actually look forward to hiring someone to help us with that now as the kitchen has gotten so busy I really want to learn from someone because I I don't have the um emotional and mental and physical capacity to do all of that too so it's been our big I love it but it's also been our biggest challenge you're working like the two like busiest full-time jobs on the planet a chef and a farmer you know are always working the most hours and you did both and a mom and a mom well yeah you know let's add to the third the trifecta so I'm curious what one two hours of sleep a night maybe yeah. oh, no, I actually totally value my sleep it's just that um, my house is a mess don't look inside <laughs> And we've hired such great people. That's it. You I, do have an amazing staff. We have a, we have a great staff because they really love to be there. Like they're really committed to sharing the same message that I started it with. So, and it's a fun job for a chef to be like, well, what's good in the garden? What's seasonal? Because that is our, that's our restriction. And it's a rule there. Like we, we do not use tomatoes in December unless they're from a can and I'll use canned tomatoes all day long. But you really have to follow the seasons because our goal is to yeah. get people comfortable with what is in season now. And frankly, we cheat it sometimes. I think late July um, we don't didn't have corn in yet, and Kate's like, "Can I can I put corn on a menu?" And I'm like, "All right," because they'll be getting corn. You know, we'll start seeing yeah. corn, so that helps to train people. But we bought it at new seasons, frankly. Like, so it's right. it's one of those things that seasonality is a big thing, and it's I think it's better for everybody as they learn to cook seasonally, including our chefs, to be narrowed down by that. It yes. used to be really cool when I first was a trained chef to get your um, muscles from New Zealand and your, you know, all these things from all over. And that showed a level of sophistication and it's the opposite, yeah. you know, now. And I'm so much more comfortable with where we are now. <laughs> it's like, let's do everything as season, as seasonally and as locally as possible. Yeah. And you guys mentioned our, you mentioned our table cooperative, which is just up the road. Uh-huh. So I like that even if maybe your farm didn't have enough of what you needed, you still stayed local. New season still pulls from local. Yeah, they do a great um, job. So yeah. But she also mentioned, is that a good transition? She also mentioned when she first became a trained chef. So is it time to talk about when she first became one? 
I think that is always going to be a good story. Okay. Well, I I went to culinary school for the fun of it. I didn't really? think in any way that I was going to be a chef. No, I, I had a degree in finance and worked as an analyst. And okay, this is more fun. <laughs> <Yes>. So sexy <laughs> in comparison so to, to working in a cubicle on Excel spreadsheets. No. Although I like that. I mean, I really liked my job. It's just I, I also like to talk, and that's you don't do a lot of that in mm-hmm. analyst jobs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I went as my early midlife crisis. At 27, like, I, I think I want to go to culinary school. I'm going to sell everything. And did that and then thought I'd just go back into some sort of business-related job in food. Like, I thought I'd go to work for Provista, you know, which is a specialty food importer and distributor. Or, you know, I don't, I don't know, sell for Cisco. I had no real design or real plan, maybe even finance for a food service company. I looked at Oregon Spice, you know, like, so that was my goal. And then I started catering right out of it, out of school, just to, to try to not get a job. I was just stalling, trying to make money to get by, and I didn't need that much money because I had lived without it for that year, a year and a half of culinary school. And so the catering got me a little bit more passionate even for serving people, for really taking care of whatever they could come up with was their need. I could do it with joy because frankly, I really, really, really am happy in the service of others. I like taking your plate. I like getting you a glass of water. I, I really like filling your wine glass. That's just what fills my um, like personal needs, yeah. just taking care of people. Yeah. So um, I found that I really loved that. And then I then I got a job working for Wolf and Sub Zero. So I oh, met wow. them at a um, at a home show, and they were they were I was pretty passionate about the, well that's food, but yeah. the appliances. I was like, oh, what I could do with this, and they were like, well, we need someone, and so I ended up working for them. For in fact, we've had a relationship for 13 years now, um, cooking in a more of a corporate environment for. Um, architects, designers, yeah. whoever, high-end remodelers, things like that. And that's where I really got used to cooking and talking. I started teaching at Sur La Table also right out of culinary school on the side. So I was the cooking and talking and serving, <laughs> just those skills developed over that time. And it's a different skill. Right. You, cooking is one thing and right. being able to cook and put out great food. Talking is another thing. I have a combination of the two that seem to put me in exactly the right spot for the job I have. You well, know? It, it's yeah. rare because, I mean, if, if, right. if you've ever watched, you know, Next Food Network Star, uh-huh. which I have religiously, uh-huh. you watch. There, Those are two very special skill sets, and it's rare for somebody to be blessed with both especially at the same time because cooking takes a lot of concentration it does i have the scars on my fingers to prove it with the knife work (laughs) so to do both and not sever something or burn yourself which i do again and not hate yourself in the process that's another thing (laughs) a lot of chefs are perfectionists yeah um so to be able to allow um a little bit more room for variation like oh i was talking too much so this is turning out a little differently you have to really be able to work on your feet and be comfortable having people around you in like in your kitchen right. and in your space. And for whatever reason, that's, I'm perfectly suited for this job. I am not the chef for, you know, I'm not the most creative chef that's going to open a restaurant and be killing it and having people write about me every day. No. Like that's, uh, there's, there's so many different skill sets. This just happens to be the exact skill set for me. And so even when we, um, Right. We decided to open the kitchen, and uh, and that was after finding the property. In fact, our uh, the location for Wolf and Sub Zero in Portland was just happening to be moved to Seattle, and I was like, "Well, I can I buy my kitchen?" They're you know piecing it out at this point. I'm like, "Cause I'm gonna have a barn on a farm someday," and so I literally bought my demonstration kitchen and had paid somebody to take it apart, like granite cabinets, all that, all the appliances. And, we shoved it into a pod and I was like, cause one day I'm going to reinstall that in a barn. And we bought the property literally a month later. Oh, wow. wow. It sat in that pod for two years while I, um, had to get the permitting from the County. That was a little bit of a challenge cause it's just different. We were asking yeah. to do something really different. And then I decided to get pregnant with twins that came prematurely. So we had a list, a couple of hiccups, um, to get the kitchen open, wow. but at the same point it happened exactly how it was supposed to. So right. it was a plan that just took a while to get actually done. But those cabinets, it's, I mean, those type of things like oh, repurposing cabinets, repurposing the appliances. And now, um, the Wolf and Sub Zero actually, they do their demonstration dinners at the kitchen. Oh, wow. After a few years of me not being able to go out and do all those things, right. they were like, well, we'll come, we'll to, just you. come to you. Yeah. Can, can we come to you? And so we get the opportunity of meeting a lot of new people hosting those once or twice a month, yeah. every month, which is fun because it's I get to do the same thing I was doing for years and years. I love that they come to you, and honestly, I, there's just not a cuter, more enjoyable space than the barn and that kitchen within it. Um, you guys are you. so inviting just as humans. You invite people in in such a lovely way, but then it's also just so beautiful. So I love that you saved it because it was worth it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And it made it affordable, frankly. That's yes. another thing. Like, it's, it is a, I'll say, it is a beautiful kitchen. People walk in, they're like, holy cow. And I'm like, well, it's because I spent 
peanuts on it. <laughs> you know, like we, we, that, that yeah. putting that together would have cost a lot of money had we not had things just line up exactly how they were supposed to, right. you know, and the fact that we did have that delay with having the premature, um, twins just meant that I got to, we got to take the time to, you know, like I sanded and painted and, and glued every one of those cabinets to make them go from a modern kitchen to a, to a farmy type yeah. kitchen. Like we did all the work ourselves, which is, it just gave us that time. Maybe I would have had more pressure had we not had yeah. the kids to slow us down. So it worked. <laughs> one of the fun things for you though, has got to be the fact that you actually get to share your creations and, and see the people enjoy them. Cause that's the one thing as a restaurant chef, you're stuck back in the kitchen and you're throwing stuff out there and presuming they love it you're just you checking the plates it. when it comes back right <laughs> do yeah. they like it yeah. um yeah it's it's so fun we really we get tons of feedback and people are really happy not just with the food i mean that's that word that's the the meat and potatoes of literally i guess <laughs> it, but like the, putting out good food isn't really the is that's not that hard if you just take we source really great ingredients and that's another rule at the kitchen like we we don't um worry about expense as much as which is an interesting part of the business that we're learning um but we we get really good ingredients and then there's just people that work there that just know how to not mess it up you know it's just cooking it properly seasoning it properly looking at food simply and so it's we always know like that's the one thing that we're super confident it's going to be good but then just to see people really enjoy the space and just like in yeah. like they feel comfortable there they're like there's yeah. just really good energy in here and i'm like it is it's I agree, and I don't. That just came organically. That was not by uh, design necessarily. It's just that, organically. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's, that, all, he's all that. that. Yeah, uh, it just na- naturally. <laughs> um, shoot, what? It, it just came together really well. People are like, "This space is so lovely." I'm like, "Yeah, that's luck," because I have no design skill. Like, if it's not sitting in front of me in a magazine, I wouldn't. <laughs> I I am not creative in that regard. It just turned everything has turned out exactly how I guess it was supposed to, which is. Gobs of luck and blessings. Well, and I think when you, like you mentioned, you did the work yourselves. I think when people um, do the work themselves, there's just something that comes across that way. And yes, sometimes it can come across as, Ooh. <laughs> but like, in wow, your guys, this was done yeah, yourself. <laughs> but this one comes you across. Hired. Yeah, it is a perfectly beautiful, uh, you know, updated farmhouse, but cozy. And you guys have this magical way because I've done other cooking classes too. And it's just like you mentioned, it's, they are so much more formal in yours. You're in this beautiful space, welcoming glass of whatever you want to drink. And you are in there and you guys have a way of making the meal come out beautifully with your skills, but you so involve us in cooking it. And it's, even if we are horrible, it still comes out an amazing meal. And nobody's really no. no, that's. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, there's some people that no. I'm not gonna need that's, I mean, we just guide them throughout the process. Right. And you there's do. so much more you learn from that hands on aspect. I just sent a recipe of one of my favorite current dishes of roasted cauliflower with tomatoes and things. <laughs> and um, I sent it to my sister in law, who's one of my best friends. They moved to Puerto Rico. So she doesn't get to come to classes anymore. And she, so I sent her this and she's, she was like, okay, I got it all wrong. You have no idea what, what I learned from coming to your classes. She's like, I now the ratio was wrong of tomatoes tomatoes to cauliflower she's like but when you get to see it made even if your your hands aren't in it but you learn a lot in those things to see a dish come together to see ratios see how to um how to fix it as you go like oh you have more of this well here's how i would change how this goes together and here's what the vinaigrette should look like texturally and why you chopped capers versus whole capers and when you do so it's all those little details that you just kind of tuck in the back of your head where hands-on makes a difference when it's just made for you you just don't get that um it's not not the easiest way to remember. Yeah. Getting it a couple different ways is pretty useful. And you guys are super helpful too with recipes. You are yeah. not stingy with recipes. People, last time we were there, one of Every the, time I'm there. Yeah. One I can't have one. The gentleman yeah. asked about something. You said, oh, immediately. Oh, let me go get that recipe. And you can, and he, I mean, he was stunned that you were just going to give it away. Like, oh, there, there's <laughs> nothing that hasn't been done with food before. So like, it, they're not our recipes. If you think about it, <laughs> right. we just took the time to type them. But <laughs> it's, it, no, we, right. that's, what would you have if you weren't learning? Like that's right. like, if you, somebody want, like we make um, granola and we sell it at the kitchen and we make our red wine caramel and we sell it at the kitchen. But if somebody asked for the recipe, like if you want to do that, it's a lot of work. Go ahead. Yeah. Do that. <laughs> don't, don't drive here and buy it. Like we'd rather people were making food in their kitchens, yeah. sharing it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That, that will always be the way we are. Good. So Good. when I remember my, my last stay there or stay, but my last trip there is um, we had those, the, the pork tacos uh-huh. and that salsa. Now, 
for my audience that doesn't know, I am originally from the Southwest. I know Mexican food. I love Mexican food. That is something you don't find much in this state. There's some amazing things here, but that's not one of them. That salsa was one of the best salsas. I mean, the tacos were amazing, but the salsa I was just in awe of. And I got the recipe of it. Haven't tried to make it yet, but it it was fantastic. And that, the funny thing is you asked for the recipe for that. And that was one of the, that wasn't a hands-on class that you were at. We were just making yeah, lunch yes. for you guys. And that was Andrea's salsa. And I was like, oh, Andrea, Andrea can you write that recipe? And she's like, <laughs> and she, and and she did. did right in the back. Yeah. So um, she's like, I think I've got it absolutely <laughs> right. You know, cause it's all, you're throwing it together yeah. when you know you're not actually writing a recipe. Right. And I have to agree with you. Her salsa is so good. I, I can't make it as good. She, she's got a knack for salsa, but that Sonoran salsa is beautiful. It was fantastic. I, I agree. I wish I could say um, every week you need to make a quart of that just for me personally, but then I, that seems like a weird job to say. Like, <laughs> I know that you're the director of the culinary school. Like, can you do all these other things, but also can you personally make me salsa? But I wish I could. Well, it's if you do, good. can you add another quart right, to that? And I'll right. take the other quart. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Maybe she'll hear this podcast and she'll just decide. Like, wow, wouldn't that be yeah. for Jessica's birthday? Yeah. Just make her, like a quart yeah. of that salsa. And, and if you've got extras, our address is 1830. No. Like, <laughs> Sweet 100. <laughs> I want to talk about the farm too, because I mean that that is an integral part with the with the um, the, the stuff that you grow that that becomes part mm-hmm. of the meal. However, the farm itself is an experience for your guests as well. You've really made that part of the immersive experience. So, what what prompted you to go that route from you know source for food to hey, this is part of the show too? Well, because who doesn't want to touch an animal? Like I'm a huge animal lover. Like that's why we that's another reason we did this is I want to surround myself with as much as many little hearts that beat like they're just <laughs> they're precious and I mean I, I get so much joy out of spending time with the animals like when before our kids were born we had we started having goats anytime I was like in a bad mood for some reason Jason would say like go run with your goats <laughs> because I would run out in the pasture and they'd like shake their heads and the llama would be shaking his head and chasing after me and it's that is joy bringing and there's so many people that never get to see that and I and I know that and being able to touch animals feed them, pet them, just appreciate them is cool. So it's not, it's not really about the business. Um, it's just about like, why wouldn't you share that if you could? And our animals are so manhandled that they're super nice. Like they're tame. You, yeah. you met the cows, mm-hmm. which I'm just, I'm so in love with these cows. Uh, so we've got the baby Jersey dairies, dairy, dairy cows that I can't wait for their, their milk. And it's going to be two years. So I, I must wait, but <laughs> just the idea that people can know that a large animal like that is approachable. I'm, we're also big on safety, like you, the type of shoes you wear around cows, because frankly, they'll just step on your feet and that does not feel well. You I only, can imagine that would hurt a little yeah, bit. You, you only do that once. You only wear a flip-flop into the pasture <laughs> once to know like that is a bad choice. Actually, that's not why I wouldn't wear flip-flops, but that's another good reason. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so just that experience to be able to like love on a cow and, yeah. and make that connection between your food source. Like, right. you know, we, you have to be comfortable that that, that cow might be your meal. Not our, not our dairy cows, but so at some point they'll become hamburger. Um, and their children, and people ask like, well, are they beef cows? And I'm like, no, but we'll eat their children. Like this is a, <laughs> it's a real part of farming. And it's also just a real part of eating. Yeah. So to like separate that is hard. And so I kind of like to push that back together. Like, yes, these are our pigs and they're really cute. Sure. Scratch their chin. But next year you'll eat, we will be teaching you how to cure their meat for bacon and I like to be transparent and pull those things together just to remind people it's not I'm not just trying to be funny although sometimes it comes out that way it's just to show them that let's start making good decisions with our dollar and buy animals that are humanely raised and treated well and and maybe eat less of them well and you said the most helpful to me and I've been sharing it with several people and probably will for the rest of my life statement because I too love animals uh-huh. so much and then I have a hard time but I eat animals uh-huh. and I have a hard time distinguishing I like that veil of I don't know how they were uh-huh. cooked but I cuz I love them and if I were to hear that you did something to that one it would break my heart I don't want you to eat the one I saw mm-hmm. but I'm okay with one I didn't you know see uh-huh. and that's not okay and I need to and you said a really helpful thing which was that you love animals but you love them so much that you also love to eat them. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's true. And it's cause I, you know, you need to learn that, you know, some are for the milk. Others are going to be for, they're going to go away uh-huh. and you're going to eat them. And that to become okay with that and to, to learn that that's okay. And, well, and also it's just about how the animal is raised. Also yeah. like right. we eat happy animals. So right. like the pigs on our farm, they don't have a bad day. I mean, not even the, the last one, frankly. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe you could say they have one bad day, but they don't know what's coming. And they're they're processed, let's just 
killed. I mean, right, just, right. You they're slaughtered say. on the farm, right. and so everything like they just they really have a great life, and they were never going to be born if it wasn't for that purpose. Right. And so we eat animals, and that's what brought them to life. So just give them as good as you possibly can right and then it's just all in service of each other so i'm a fan of that but i think the more you are just reminded and not necessarily beat into your head like that's our our message isn't to be mad at people for other meat choices and everybody does what they can within their budget but if you can just kind of just remember that and think huh the more i can do to support the like the meat that's humanely raised and sometimes that means eating less of it because you can't afford to eat as much as you became used to so that's I just, just like to remind people yes. when they're there. Right. Um, but we're not, you know, waving yeah. a flag and, yeah. and grandstanding about it by any means. Sure. And that's that's another approach to our farm is the, the name Middle Ground. And that was just to find your middle ground. Like, we are not zealots on anything. And I'm not, again, judging zealots. Although that sounds, maybe the word zealot sounds strange. <laughs> but, it, you know, find what's important to you. For us, it's not eating poison, you know, or, or eating as little poison as possible. Right. I... The, the, the word organic is not on the outside of a bag of Juanitas and I'm eating those. So like, <laughs> it, so eat as those little poison chips. and they're good chips, <laughs> eating as little poison as possible right. and taking really good care of animals. Right. The end. I drive an SUV. We do air travel. People could judge <laughs> that. Like, so we just like to pe- people to find what they're comfortable with, what's important to them, find their middle ground and then do that um, without judging other people's version of whatever that is, you know? That. So that's, it's, it's come nobody comes with we're never going to judge you is the bottom line and if something's super important to you i hope you don't judge me you know for something (laughs) that i might do wrong but i can tell you that we're not going to put poison in our food and we're not going to treat an animal bad like i love it i love it so obviously you know the farm has grown a lot and the operation has changed a lot what else do you kind of have in your vision for middle ground farms because if i know one thing about you it's that you're never just resting on your laurels you're always looking ahead yeah, well, it's, as you as we mentioned, there's a lot that has happened that we didn't necessarily anticipate with how busy we are, and like a, there's there's limitations. I want to have everybody employed and everybody their schedules full and everybody happy. <laughs> um, but there's areas of growth that we haven't really explored. Like, for instance, the kitchen has its limits. It's busy. It's really busy right now. <laughs> Meaning, if it's not a class that we're offering on our website, which we continue to add that because our customers want it, and that's great. The rest of the time is filled in with private events, and and which is super fun. People come saying, "I want to." do this or learn this or I just want to be with my people maybe you just cook for us most of it's hands-on but (laughs) that's filling up our schedule so our other direction is going to just continue to build that like community of reasons to be at the farm like sell the message maybe maybe there's not as many spots to take in a class because our classes fill up so um, quickly so we're thinking as we grow the farm side of it we can offer produce maybe a CSA in the future so that we can those same customers that come to the kitchen and learn in our hands-on cooking classes also can learn through what we provide for them because we're already writing the recipes so like here's here's what you get and here's all the things you can do with it so we're continuing to teach people in their own homes by forcing them to use vegetables that they otherwise wouldn't because that's I've been accused of that I'm a total vegetable pusher like (laughs) like let me teach you how to let me sneak this into your diet so learning through sharing food with them and if we're going to be scaling up from a how we're learning about the farming as I mentioned so scaling up the farm side why not share that and I'm not saying on a big level um, there's a lot of people that farm all the time and do that and they're great um, we want to learn from them maybe hire one of them <laughs> yeah. hint hint and, so if you're um, listening now vegetable farmer so just another way of having them having our customers learn or touch get to touch them um, without having them in a class since right. our schedule fills up and people are like oh I'm trying to get into this class and it's sold out I'd I'd rather be able to continue to maintain that relationship and that sense of community through right. products from the farm as well um, and being I, I'm not naive farming profitably organically on a small scale is almost like a unicorn <laughs> like, <laughs> and but that's okay frankly yeah. like we're we're not doing that with it. there's nobody i'm not going to get rich nobody's going to be doing the backstroking cash on our property from our business venture but well, you didn't plant it, money trees on the farm i'm working on it <laughs> um, but we'll in fact the funny thing my husband said when we bought the property because it was in foreclosure when we bought it he's like you've bought a mole farm that's the only thing that we can <laughs> consistently produce great numbers of with no peril is moles anyway side note so um we will yeah we're hoping to it, break even on a farming venture to be totally honest is like yeah. just to be able to provide um like 
hum- not humanely raised when it's vegetables, but I guess they're human. Clean, clean product, yeah. product, clean produce for people to eat, and we can help introduce some new things to them with some recipes and stuff like that. One more reason to to come by the farm. Well, it's a beautiful space. I'm sorry. No, you're good. It, it, it's a beautiful space, but I know. I mean, how much of your 17 acres is mm-hmm. actually currently being used for farming? Because I think you've like five. So say, because I mean, right. I'm not good at judging spaces, but I think you've got a lot of room to grow. So much space wise. Right. We have so much pasture at this point. And right. we're just, in fact, we just ha- had a landscape architect person come out and figure out what, you know, from an elevation standpoint, yeah. where we could put things, where we have flat enough ground for greenhouses. Like, what can we do over the next 10 years moving forward that makes sense for our property and where water goes? And and right. it's it's a learning curve because, again, I wasn't born a farmer. <laughs> um, and so just how you use your property effectively is something that we're, we're learning. And we're learning it from other people, so, which we're, you know, grateful for. Well, I also want her to give me a quick, because as a person who does not enjoy vegetables, uh-huh. um, you said you're a vegetable pusher. So give give a little, a little sample of your pitch about why vegetables are so good to... Well, for one, you just haven't had them cooked, right? I'm Probably. telling you, like properly roasted golden beet, like I said, mentioned golden beets earlier, golden beets, carrots pulled right out of the ground. Oh, the, they have okay. so yes. much good flavor when roasted and seasoned properly. So take a a golden beet, peel it, chop it into pieces, maybe one inch cubes, and maybe have baby carrots and toss them in olive oil, salt and pepper, and just roast them at a high temperature, like say 400 degrees, until they're fork tender, but a little bit crispy on the outside. And they're super, super sweet. Like they've got that, um, like there's a lot of sugar in beets, frankly. So there's that caramelization of the sugars in them. The carrots are a little bit caramelized because you put enough oil on them. They've got a great texture on the outside and that crispiness. And then salt is super important. Yes. So like not, so seasoning vegetables appropriately so they taste more like vegetables, not that they taste salty, but a carrot with salt tastes more like carrot, you know, a beet Uh that is properly seasoned. It doesn't just taste like dirt. It actually tastes like sweetness. And so people just either... It, they just don't exactly know how to cook the things yeah. right or season them appropriately. They season their meat, but people often forget that the vegetables need some love too. They really do. Um, we, um, somebody in the kitchen the other day made what we call a ratatouille tion, which is take ratatouille is typically eggplant and tomato and squash, and it's cooked almost into a stew. Okay. Um, then, then there was the movie Ratatouille. We made a beautiful version it, of it's it. It's a favorite in my house. Right, the, so, at our house too. Um <laughs> Kate started making this in a cast iron pan just because it's beautiful, like layers of gorgeous vegetables. And I had one that a students had made and we hadn't quite got, got to them yet. I tasted it and it just didn't have enough seasoning. And it just, it was just beautiful vegetables, same lovely vegetables without an appropriate amount of salt. And I was like, huh, it's interesting. Like when Kate makes it, like we just hadn't got, like that that one cast iron pan had been missed a little um, of, the, of just the teaching of how generously right. you need to season things sometimes, especially just just vegetables like they yeah. need they need salt and it fell flat so if you were to eat a properly seasoned ratatouille tian it meets all your needs it's beautiful has all this gorgeous color in it the layering of the vegetables is gorgeous looks like a big flower in a cast iron pan like there isn't anything prettier i don't think than that dish okay. but then when you so great we meet it on the eyes but then when you taste it it's like huh like i could i could take this or leave it yeah. but i know when it's seasoned properly it's like it, this is I want to eat this all the time like okay. why we should all be eating these vegetables all the time and you can become fairly addicted to them when they're just properly cooked and I, th- I think that whole trend of the 90s of like the whole salt is evil thing back in the 90s was probably one of the worst things that ever happened to food yes until like recently when when cooking shows really took off and people became foodies again was they remembered oh hey salt isn't bad if you don't just like down it and it really helps bring out flavor and i think people got used to seeing because of tv chefs which yeah. is awesome they got to see what seasoning means like the the fat pinches of salt like we all threw away our salt shakers and started to use our hands to really grasp the amount of salt we're putting in you witness other people like oh that's what they mean by seasoning not like shake shake you know yeah. a, t- a couple of right uh, little granules of iodized salt is different than the salty flavor you get from like a, a good grind of like a, a small grind of sea salt you get yeah. a lot of like salt flavor and right. um yeah I'm, I'm glad that salt has come back i hope i never get to the point health wise that i need to let go of, some of it. <laughs> but uh, i mean and that's healthy people can 
process salt really well. Yeah. Sick people can't, so yeah. I never want to be right. sick. So that's why you eat your vegetables. That's back to the point. And also, we brought it full of circle. All of the, think of all of the nutrients in vegetables. Anytime you're eating color, you're eating vitamins. Anytime you're eating vegetables, you're eating antioxidants. Anytime you eat something local and seasonal, you're eating the, the bacteria out of the ground that is supposed to be good for your biome at this point in the year. Like, there's so much health wise that goes into eating seasonally from dirt that's from like good dirty dirt you know not <laughs> sterile um dirt like my right. husband and i when we drive by a, a clearly non-organic farm it's um it's totally obvious like it looks beautiful <laughs> like conventional farming can look great straight rows no weeds growing in between it and that's like i don't want to eat that mm-hmm. because you know if something's not growing in that dirt it's probably for a reason right. you know so the prettier it looks uh, the more worried it is i i am or yeah, when i take yard must be healthy as hell then yeah. Yeah. Like a lot when, of weeds <laughs> when you take people to the farmer's market and you see like people sometimes don't buy the produce that has like the kale leaves with holes in it and i'm like if a bug could live there that means life happens there you know um like <laughs> that's, that's a actually a, a good thing if it's absolutely perfect i mean don't get me wrong you can get absolutely perfect out of organic farming too and i one day i hope i can by you know introducing predatory bugs there's all sorts of good ways to do it but um if life is in that plant, that's right. a, that's a good thing because that means it's feeding you nutrients. So, so she's convincing me, and she has already mentioned that she's not judge, judgmental. So she mm-hmm. won't judge me when I tell her that I get my vegetables through a powder and a smoothie and other things. <laughs> hey, at least you're getting nutrients, <laughs> baby stuff. <laughs> but I would like to transition to that um, because I go lots of places, and everyone has a vegetable or something in the food. And I even had a waiter judge me over the weekend because I was pulling out the tomatoes from whatever the dish was and he's like those are really good please try it and I did and it was good okay good. but but I wouldn't have had he not given me a hard time you know um so I need to I want to learn okay I'll keep harassing okay. you a little well, bit good. She, she won't judge my bag salad that I had yesterday to go along with something but hey, it's still salad <laughs> the tomatoes I, I grew myself nice work by buying up potted tomato plant from home depot but they're growing great so oh my god but that's the amazing thing with that fresh stuff it's like it's candy i'll just pop those off and just eat just the tomato i mean that's and there's that sense of pride that i kind of sort of had something to do with this totally it feels really good it feeds you in a different way yeah so imagine what it will taste like when you can come out to the farm and have fresh jersey milk speaking of the fruit like the direction we're going like those beautiful cows um are going to grow up and be lovely have lovely high milk fat jersey milk you know, separates cream on top. All that we'll be able to cook with that in the kitchen. Maybe share some of that with customers. We'll see oh, how that I'm, goes. I'm buying some of that. Um, I cook with so much cream at home. I'm, I, that would be amazing. Yeah. So to, that's another reason right. that we just want to sh- grow more in the farm side of it is just to be able to share that because people are like, oh, can we buy some of those? We're like, actually, we can barely grow enough for <laughs> what we do here. In right. fact, we, we buy from other people. So I'd love to get to the point where we can share some of the stuff we're cooking with um, with customers. I know. I think I, I think I ask you every time I go whether the goat – um, goat milk. It's, it's actually, is it, how do you pronounce it? Is it Chev? Chev. Yep. Chev. Chev. Just going to okay. ignore the R. Ignore the R. Okay. So Chev, I'm obsessed with yours. And I think I ask you hoping each time the answer will be like, yes, now we have enough. Yes. <laughs> but no, I know. It's, it's that, in that whole limitation of you can't sell, yes. you can't sell cheese unless no. you're a licensed dairy, which I thought at one point that would be a direction we'd go. Now I'm like, oh, that's, that smacks of effort. <laughs> if, you, if you ever, like whatever you pay yeah. a farmstead creamery for their cheese, never fit. Like if it's $26, $27, $30 a pound, don't worry. You're not paying too much. Like the work that it. goes into cheese, the work that goes into cheese just to pay those people to like barely make it. Like it's so much work. So I, um, I'm a big fan of supporting yeah. any small creamery because they work really hard to get that really good product yeah. in your hands. And so let's keep them doing it by paying for it. Yeah. Um, what kind of cheeses do you make? Just at this point, just chef. Just chef. Yep. Okay. I mean, and it's amazing because like, I, I personally, oh. yeah, personally I used to make everything. We made a lot of camembert and brie and blue and I've made Parmesan once that was so sad. By the way, you know how many like gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons it goes into like a pound of cheese and they're on in nine months. It's, Wow. Pay a lot for Parmesan too. It's oh. thing. It's I so do. much, so much work, and it, it's so little yield compared to the amount of milk it takes. Oh, really? So we will not be making that again. Oh. Uh, but I know. I wish we could. But there are people that do a really great job at that. So <laughs> divide and conquer. They do that. <laughs> we will make chef. So I love cheese making. I could make a lot of different kinds, but that's just more things to do. And there's only yeah. so many hours in the day. Well, and what are you going to make? So the Jersey cows, they will have 
milk in two years from now? Cause you mm-hmm. just got them like pretty recently. Yeah. Um, so year. what kind of cheese will you make with the, with that? I don't even know. Okay. It doesn't matter. I mean, even at the <laughs> simplest level for Maj Blanc, like we'll have a lot of milk to deal with, you know, every day. Sure. And so a lot of it will be used just in our basic cooking and things sure. like that as milk right. Um, right. and cream. And then we'll probably end up using um, the rest of it for simple cheeses, like fresh cheeses, ricotta, mozzarella, fromage blanc, um, just because there's ways to introduce those into menus very, very easily. I don't know that we'll get to the point of really having aged cheese because that's a whole other beast yeah. and a right. whole other room. Yeah. Different equipment. So yeah. the simple cheeses are what we're going to be capable of. And then we'll probably share some of the milk just because that makes sense. You can And you can get away with that legally. Yes. I mean, that's the best way to get away with, meaning cheese you can't, you can't right. sell as easily. And, but milk, there's, yeah. with a small farm like ours, we could. Totally. And people want it. Yeah. To be able to have access to yeah, raw Jersey milk. Right I mean, it's beautiful. <clears throat> For sure. Beautiful ingredient. For sure. That's where we're headed. Yeah. So changing gears a little bit, yeah. I'm, I'm curious with all the stuff that you make and everything, and I'm sure it changes. And you kind of touched on the ramen earlier, but so right now, what is your favorite thing that you guys make in the kitchen that you're just obsessed with? Tough question. I like to put people on the spot. Apparently. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> See, it's going to be all things that are vegetables. That's like okay. that's all I can think about is all the, like, this sounds so simple, but like grilled vegetables, just stuff pulled out of the garden, grilled vegetables. Um, we are obsessed with a recipe that we requisitioned from a cookbook earlier this year, <laughs> last year, maybe with the t- chopped castle Vetrano olives on it and orange zest and all this deliciousness as a salsa on top of grilled vegetables. So mm. like that I could eat every single day. Oh no, 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 no. That's not going to be it though. Because the thing that I, that we made on Friday is okay. That's my obsession. I love <laughs> the grilled vegetables. You should eat those. Okay. Um, okay, no. Okay. So two years ago we did a farmer's market class where we came home with a bunch of corn and Kate had learned in culinary school, but had never made it since somebody had made fresh corn polenta I was like I don't even know what you're talking about um, taking the ears of corn and grating all of the corn off of it scraping the cob so that you get the like the natural cornstarch that is in corn out of the cob and then cooking it down till it tastes like polenta like the grain polenta if you think about okay. that um, it's like a porridge of sorts but made with just fresh corn so meaning it is super sweet and delicious and table corn the corn you would normally eat so it's got that high sugar content cooked down into polenta so we just started making that again in the kitchen because it's corn season and so i had that on friday and i could eat that for every meal well that's amazing because polenta is normally something that just is used to absorb the flavors of other things so for it to have its own Oh, it's, it's so good. So we made it on Friday with a bunch of braised greens. And this was for a private event. A customer wanted, she was having her, her, her people over. And she said, can you use some collards and greens from our garden? And I said, absolutely. You know, sure. So she, she wanted the, the, that feel good feeling of, yeah. I grew this and I'm sharing it with my people. But just, she didn't want to do it in her house. She wanted to do it in ours. <laughs> right. I don't so want to clean up afterwards. we braised these greens and served them atop of this um, fresh corn polenta. And that was, I mean, we also had beautiful ribeyes, uh, oh. a chamula sauce, like... We did those grilled vegetables with the Castle Vachano olives that I talked about. A lot of really good food, but people came up more often than not to say like, what in the world did you do to that corn? We're like, it's just corn. Well, what makes it so creamy? Did you add a lot of cream to it? No, it, it's just corn. <laughs> like it, it's just, it's so good. So that, that would probably be the dish. It's kind of a showstopper. Like it, it surprises you how good something that you expect it to be the vehicle for a you know, ragu on top yeah. right. and you're like, why am I not eating this all the time? And we had dessert put out and um, a customer told me that they talked to chef Quinn and said like, is there, could I get more of that? Is there any more polenta? I'd rather <laughs> eat that for dessert. Cause it was, just, it's corn in all of its loveliness. And like, oh, we're wow. entering into full corn, like through September, we will have lovely corn. Our, we've got a corn grower cause we, our corn patch that was, we started growing our own corn and it just goes away like this, like right. 50 years of corn. I mean, it takes some space to grow corn. So yeah. we right. have a farm in Westland that grows all of our corn for us and they're, they're just coming into it. So we're super excited. And they said the, they planted well, uh, that they'll, we'll have corn through the end of September. So oh, can't we'll be wait. having that corn polenta fresh corn. There's all nothing like the it. time. So you can't have it every day. I can't have it every day, but it's also, as she mentioned, it's how she made, you know, it's all about, making they're asking you what's in it it's just corn it's about how you make it and you're totally. teaching them how to make it and i learned from another chef at the kitchen right, i wouldn't right. have done that i wouldn't have thought of that so that's the nice thing about coming together yeah. and that menu on friday other than that was supposed to be fairly keto by the way they were like please you know we like we like meat we like vegetables and i was like 
So you're going to eat corn though. The corn's not keto. We eat the right things at the right time. Like this is in season. You should always eat peaches when they're in season. Eat corn. Let's not be nuts about diets and let's just celebrate the really great food that is seasonal. And sugar is never seasonal. White sugar, never seasonal. White flour, never seasonal. But to appreciate like peaches and corn and all these lovely things and berries when they're in season, that's what you should eat. Absolutely. And they were happy with it because of that corn polenta. Oh, geez. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to wrap this up a little bit, but we always do one thing with our guests, and we don't tell them about it ahead of time because it's more fun this way. We like to play what is called Would You Rather. It's just another way. The whole Mm -hmm. point of this is to get to know the people behind our attractions. This is just one more way to kind of learn about the people. We have fun with it. So Molly curates five questions, and you just kind of go off the top of your head, and we just have a little fun with that. I can't wait. (laughs) So without further ado, Molly, give us Would You Rather. All right, Jessica. Would you rather be a kid your whole life or an adult your whole life? I would rather be an adult because this is fun. You get control <laughs> over stuff. So I think kids have it great. Don't get me wrong. I look at my kids. I'm like, why isn't anybody planning summer camp for me? It's <laughs> delightful. But you're also, you're a, you're a victim or a celebrator of your circumstance. Yeah. You don't have a lot of control over it. And yeah. I really like the circumstance that I curated myself. Like this is a good, I got a good life. And it's only through like choice. Not that I had a bad childhood, but I really like it being, I like it. Okay. I don't always like adulting, but I like being an adult. So I'd <laughs> yes. have to say, I want to be an, I'd want to be an adult. She answered that so easy. I, I know. Tough. That was good. Okay. All right. Would you rather be in your PJs all day or a suit all day? Oh, geez. PJs. Like, I'm virtually wearing that now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I, enough yes. said. Yeah. Yes. There's no, not a suit. Yeah. I did. I would be in the wrong, I'm in the wrong job. Yeah. If right. The suit was my goal. I'm saying I don't like all that. <laughs> okay. Would you rather spend the evening in a luxurious hotel suite or camping with beautiful scenery? Uh Uh-oh. I want to be in the suite. (laughs) (laughs) I'm in, I am in beautiful scenery all the time. Like uh, it's where we live. That's absolutely fantastic. I'll, I'll lay in somebody else's soft sheets and let them, (laughs) let them click do the housekeeping. Is that terrible? No, that's wonderful. No, I'll totally take that. Because she is true. The scenery at her, at her farm it is, is beautiful. We're, we're virtually camping all the time. Yes. Did you see my house? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's beautiful. <laughs> Love it. But no, we've get, I get so much outdoor time that it would be weird and unique and fantastic to be at a luxurious suite. So I'll take it. I love it. <laughs> well, I, I'm curious about this one. So would you rather have a lifetime supply of delicious food? I think she does. Or books? So somebody gives it to you. Somebody gives you a lifetime supply of delicious food or delicious books. So I can't have the other. Like it's like would I not be able to have any books <laughs> if I just had the? No, it's just about oh. if somebody would give it to you. I'm okay. curious because you make gorgeous uh-huh. food. So yeah. would you like the break if you just got to keep having the gorgeous food, but somebody else made it for you and gave it to you all the time? No, I like it. I I want to I want to cook my own food. Yeah, mostly. So I'll take their books. Okay. Hopefully they have good taste in books. That does right. worry me a tiny bit. But I, if, if somebody <laughs> was going to digest. gift me something, I guess gift me your books and I'll take care of my own food. Because <laughs> what if I was picky and didn't right. like what they did? Right. right. I feel, yes. Okay, that's you. a tougher one. I that's that's more of a stump. I'm stumped a little. I didn't know what she was saying. Okay. Yeah. Well. All right. Would you rather be able to take back anything you say or hear every conversation around you? So, uh, we ask the hard hitting questions. That's here. a hard one. Well, I was thinking of the take back anything. If there's something, hmm, is it a power that I could use over and over, like yeah, to yeah. take back? I, I do that okay. because um, sometimes now you're really learning about me. Um, I, I, we have a family motto that's funny first, feeling second, because <laughs> we just have fun in my family. And sometimes I'm like, oh, that didn't really hit where it was supposed to. Like, n- not everybody is funny first, feeling second. So every once in a while, I'll be funny. And then I'm like, hmm, was that as kind as it should, Did it come from a place of kindness, how they received it? So I would take, I would take that power over. I don't want to know what other people are talking about, because it doesn't matter, <laughs> like really, in the scheme of things. I, I don't want to know other people's 
opinions unless I ask them or they want to share them with me. Right. So um, if somebody wants to have a private conversation, like, please do that. I actually don't care what people talk about outside of what they're telling me. Yes. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. Yeah. I'm saying. So, so I would take the, I would take that other random superpower. Love it. I'd, I'd actually go that route too, just so, but that way I can say whatever the heck I want and then, and then pull, pull it, back. it back. It doesn't matter. Totally. Do a every, back. As everybody in my office knows, when, when I get a stupid comment or something that somebody's being snarky, I have the ultimate desire just to fire back. And it is, that's what I do. I call it like my Hollywood squares approach. Here's my bluff answer that I just tell my coworkers <laughs> so I can get out of my system. And now here's the nice answer. If I no, I know it. you have a good sense of humor. So that's and, and good, I, mean, well, fun, you know, either way. <laughs> there's a, this fine line between wit and sarcasm. I'm tr- I try to stay on the wit side, but every once in a while I'm like, oh, huh, wish I could pull a take back on that one. <laughs> because you really should come from kindness. Yes. But I've had 45 years of practice looking for funny first. So <laughs> we're, I'm working on it. I like that approach. <laughs> So tell every, all of our listeners how they can uh, find out more about Kitchen Middle Ground Farms and possibly even book a class. Yeah, well, I mean, first, I always invite people to come there. Um, you can find information on our website, which is middlegroundfarms.com, um, or by Googling or any kind of search engine, the, the kitchen at, and it's going to come up. Um, we're rated in some search engines as the best cooking class, which I just absolutely Ooh. love. Um, so online, we've got a great online presence where there's a, a schedule of classes, upcoming classes, but those are always changing and more things are always happening there. Um, we also are pretty active on Instagram and our Facebook page sharing what events we're having. So like, like us on that, yeah, how, yeah. however it is you follow. Yeah. And I mean, you do a great job of sharing what classes you know, what things we have coming. So thank you for that support on your, your um, website and social media and then calling. If you've got questions or you want to book a private event or know how that works or what it costs or what that looks like, um, Corey is there answering the phone right now. She's always there. Um, making sure to share whatever, whatever we can do with people to either to sneak them in a class, even if it says it's sold out, sometimes we can manage to do that or help you design a great event yeah. that's just for you, which is so fun. Awesome. So folks, Bookmark that website, middlegroundfarms.com, because it's always changing. You'll find great stuff. Jessica, thanks for coming in. We appreciate oh, it. You're very welcome. Yeah. This was this was fun. Not scary at all. See, we, we try to be easy, <laughs> except for that one uh, would you rather question from Molly. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry that about a, that. That was a toughie. Thanks for coming in. <laughs> thank you. And thank you to our listeners. And be sure to follow us on, uh, let's see, we're on YouTube. We're on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, anywhere else we can host the podcast, SoundCloud. So be sure to subscribe to us, and you can hear all the fascinating stories of Mount Hood Territory. Thanks for listening. 